Father, we just ask you, Lord, to pour out your spirit upon us, Lord. Lord, I ask you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to rest upon this teaching, Father. Lord, I pray that these words would be words that are sharp. I pray that these words would be words that are true. Lord, let the truth come to us, Lord. Lord, we want the truth spoken in love so that we can grow up, Lord. Lord, I ask you in the name of Jesus, Father, for the, you would bring the power of the Holy Spirit upon this teaching. Give us the ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church. Father, I ask you, Lord, that you would drive away distractions. You would drive away everything in our minds that would try to clutter us from hearing and receiving. Lord, we want to be able to hear the voice of the Lord. Speak to us, Lord. We want to hear truth, Lord, we pray. In the name of Jesus, we ask, Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and we'll turn in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3 right now. Does this mic sound okay? Is it a little louder? Okay. So if I need to change back to the other one, just let me know. Okay, so let's, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, we mentioned this a, uh, a couple weeks ago, but I want to just do a quick review to get us in line with what the Lord is wanting to unfold to us. But Paul is, is talking here in, Revel in Ephesians chapter 3, and he's saying to us that by revelation there was made known, known to me the mystery. And so what we're talking about now is the mystery of, of Christ. And this mystery of Christ only comes by revelation. We cannot understand it by knowledge or facts. It has to come by revelation. And Paul is talking about if you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. Now, he goes on to reveal down in verse 6 this is what the, the, the revelation that Paul is unveiling. The mystery that, of Christ that Paul is unveiling is that Gentiles are fellow members of the body. The profound thing that Paul is saying, we often think the, the revelation of Christ is like what Paul unveiled in Colossians when he unfolded the majesty and the transcendence of the person of Jesus Christ. But Paul is teaching us and telling us, no, I want to reveal to you another angle of the mystery of Christ, and that is the mystery of his body that we are actually bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. Like when, when Saul of Tarsus was going on the road to Damascus, and all of a sudden the Lord interrupted his plans, and light shined down upon him. And the resurrected Jesus said to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? The very ecclesia of God in the eyes of the Lord is him. Christ is his body. And that's what Paul is teaching us here. That's what Paul is wanting to unveil to us, the mystery of Christ, which is his body. Now, let's, let's turn to one chapter before that. This is, a, this is all review from things that we've been talking about. But in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15, Paul is now bringing us back to tell us, okay, all the dividing walls have been taken down so that in himself the Lord might establish one new man. See, this is where this is headed towards, is the corporate man. Is the body being a reflection corporately of the man, Jesus Christ. This is God's eternal purpose. This is what God, this is what is driving the Godhead, is that he would have a man the man, the body of Christ, conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. This is, a, this is corporate. This is not just individual. And this is, again, reviewing some things we talked about. Now let's turn to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. This is from a couple weeks ago. I want you to see it again. We, the more and more we see it, the more and more it's going to sink into us of the ecclesia God is raising up in this hour. Genesis 1.26, 
said, the, the Lord said, then the Lord said, let us make man in our image. It's not just man as one individual or as the race of, of, of male, of the male race or whatever, the male gender. The Lord's on to the corporate man here, the very man that Paul is unveiling in Ephesians chapter 2. See, God's ultimate intention from the very beginning was to have a corporate man that would complement the man, Jesus Christ, that would be his very body, the very expression of Jesus in the earth, conformed into his image and into his likeness. Now, notice what verse 27 says of Genesis 1. It says, God created man in his own image. You see the connection between Genesis 126 and 127 and Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15, the corporate man? God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever noticed that? The corporate man is made of male and female from the very, very beginning of creation. See, God has an ultimate intention that is driving every single thing He's doing in this earth right now. And that is to conform the body of Christ into the image of His Son. That is what is driving the Godhead more than anything else, is to have a body of people conformed into the image of the man. Now, with that in mind, we're going to go back to Ephesians chapter 4, Verse 13, and it's a, a very important scripture. It's, the, it's really one of the scriptures the Lord has highlighted to us over the past year or so. It is such a vital scripture, and Paul is talking about in the context of fivefold leaders in the body of Christ, one of their main jobs, one of their main job descriptions is to see the, the church of God grow up into a mature man. And Paul's saying here, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, I love this, to a mature man. The one new man in Ephesians 2.15 is meant to become the mature man of Ephesians 4.13. See, the Lord is wanting and wanting to speak to the church in this hour. It is time to grow up. How the church, especially in America, and I could just say it all around the world, is in a state of profound immaturity and infancy. When the Lord wants to raise up a corporate expression of His Son in the earth. A mature man. Now, if you have your notes, look on uh, point number B. And I want to read it like this, just to help, us, help this really sink in, because I'm going to build upon this in a minute is that God wants to raise up a mature man, the measure of the fullness of Christ. And here's my point. Maturity comes by the measure of Jesus Christ that is living in us. Maturity does not come by trying to be a better Christian. Maturity does not come by trying to do more and be more for God in our own strength and power. Maturity comes when the measure of Christ who dwells within us is possessing us more and more and more. That's how we get mature. That's how we grow into his image. That's how we become the reflection of the hev heavenly man bearing his image. Now, this is not intended just to be for you on an individual level. This is something the Lord has just wanting to just press in because we are, we as Americans and our declaration of independence, the independence that so characterizes our culture has crept into the body of Christ and we think God works individually and the Lord has never worked individually. He's always worked on a corporate basis. And so God wants to bring us from being these independent people who just quote-unquote go to church to becoming an interdependent body who become a reflection of the mature man. And that, that maturity is based on the measure of Jesus Christ living inside of you. 
See, if the, if the life of Christ, which is in you by the Holy Spirit, is in seed form, you're going to be immature. If the amount of the Spirit of God you're allowing to live is like a tiny little seed, then you're not going to be like him. But if he begins to grow, if we begin to surrender, if we begin to yield more and more to that, the fullness of the life of Christ who dwells in us, and he begins to dwell in our heart by faith, and he begins to begin to conform our soul into his image, then Christ begins to live more and more, and then that means that we are becoming more and more into his image, more and more mature. And so that is what, that is what Paul is driving here towards in Ephesians. Now, Paul tells us, I want us, this is going to be the, the, the scripture we're hitting on right now. Paul tells us as a result, because God's ultimate intention is to have a mature man, because the very thing that has driven God from before time and creation is to have a, a people in whom his life dwells, a people in whom he possesses, a people in whom have become an expression of Jesus Christ. Paul, with a burden, a profound apostolic burden, is speaking to the Ephesians. And he says, as a result, we're no longer to be children. And you can just feel the apostolic burden of Paul driven by the ultimate intention of God looking upon the church of Ephesus and saying, guys, we are immature. We're called to become a reflection of the man, Jesus Christ. And yet we're still in diapers. We're infants. We're babes in Christ. You can feel the burden of the Lord. And I can't imagine what Paul would say to the American church. But that's the burden Paul is operating on, is he's saying to us, we're not to be children any longer. We're not to be infants any longer. Just seeing the way the American church is so driven, tossed here and there by winds and waves and every doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. Now, Paul tells us, here's how we grow up. Is we speak the truth in love. We speak the truth in love. The truth spoken in love is how we grow up. If we have the truth without love, it will bring condemnation, guilt, shame, and death. And there'll be no difference between the truth of the new covenant and the truth of the old covenant. But if we speak the truth with love, but not have, or if we speak with love without truth, we are going to have impurity, immorality, lawlessness, and immaturity. So a lot of what's happening today in the American church is lovey-dovey messages are being spoken without truth, and as a result, the, ch the church has become lawless in a, in a large degree. But Paul is telling us the truth spoken in love is how the body of Christ grows up as children to become the image and the reflection of the mature man, Jesus Christ. Now, this is, this is where he's building on in verse 16, in verse 16, he's saying, from whom the whole body, or, or let me just read this uh, back to verse 15. Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up into all aspects unto him who is the head. So Paul's saying we are to grow up. I, I really like what Mike Bickle said. He said that many in the church are waiting to go up in the rapture. But God is wanting us to grow up. And I can't think of anything more true than that. Anything that the Lord would want to say to the body of Christ, anything more than what the Spirit of God is saying to the church in this hour is, is friends, saints, body of Christ, it's time to grow up. It's time to grow up into the head. Now, he's not just talking individually, he's talking corporally. Now, that does affect us individually, as we're about to see, because... If individually we are still immature, then corporately we will become, we will be immature. But if individually we are beginning to grow up into his image, into his likeness, into his maturity, then corporately also we will become mature. Now here in verse 16, Paul says, whom the whole body, 
being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies. Basically, what he's, this is what he's basically saying, is the body of Christ who's connected relationally to each other, an interdependent body. He says, what every joint supplies. Now, this is very interesting here. Then this next phrase that in my translation, the New American, uh, New American Standard, it says, according to the proper working of each individual part. If you actually get down into the Greek, a better way to read it is according to the measure. Remember the word measure from Ephesians 4.13. According to the measure effectively working in each individual part. He's referencing Ephesians 4.13 to say, this is what he's trying to say, I believe. The measure of Christ that fills the individual part of the body as the, as the measure of Christ increases in the individual parts of the body, then that effective working joined and fit together then causes the growth of the body. Now, he's not talking about numerical growth here. He's talking about growing up unto him who is the head. He's talking about spiritual maturity. He's talking about the corporate man growing in to the mature man who reflects his image, not just individually, but corporately. And so Paul gives us a strong ex exhortation. He says, grow up, grow up. Now, last Sunday we talked about the first one, the first thing that would hinder us from growing up, or what are those things that keep us immature, that we're, we're going to spend a couple weeks on this, is number one, as we said, we have embracing another Jesus is what keeps us immature. And you can, you can refer to the message from last Sunday to see everything we talked about, but the basic idea is that another Jesus is being preached around the world Another gospel is being preached around the world. And if we receive that Jesus and that gospel, it will keep us immature. I'm not going to rehash that, so you can go back and, and listen to that. Now, the, the second thing we want to look at today is what keeps us immature is offense. Offense. Let's look at Matthew chapter 24, verse 10. is I believe offense is one of the number one things that keeps the body of Christ like children. We have become so thin-skinned, so sensitive, so easily offended at the slightest little thing. And as you'll see, it is a strategic plan of the devil. It's in fact the bait of Satan. To, that we would bite into a fence and be entrapped and ensnared by the devil. But a fence, I believe, is what keeps so many in the church in a state of immaturity. We get offended at everything. This person didn't look at me the right way. This person didn't talk to me and this Sunday, or this person didn't said this or said that or made this comment or made that comment or whatever. We get so offended. We get offended because we think God should have acted one way and he acted another, or he delayed, or he didn't bring the breakthrough. We get offended at this. We get offended at that. We're so easily offended. I'm glad no one's saying amen because I have found the people who say amen the loudest to these kinds of things are the most easily offended. I remember... I don't know, a couple years ago, a, a couple started coming to our church, and I became, like, their big fan, and they just, like, thought I was hung the moon. <laughs> and anyway, everything I would preach, they'd be, amen, amen. And I thought, I was like, that's cool. At least someone has a pulse. All right. So someone has some enthusiasm. But I learned really quick, the next thing you know is if you touch them just a little bit, and you press them just a little bit, how easily offended they get. One little test, boom, they're out the door. We're so easily offended. Matthew 24.10, the Lord is un unpacking what is going to be the signs of the end of the age. And we talked about one of them last Sunday, which is deception. Deception is on a, on a, on a widespread increase. And the Lord 
is going to give another key in this passage. And I'm reading from the New King James Version here. He said, then many will be offended. He didn't say a few people. He said many. He said what will characterize the end of the age is the widespread increase of offense. Now with traditional media and social media and all that you can, that's so available now, the world has spiraled into this constant state of offense. And I believe the Lord's warning the body of Christ saying, you are so easily offended. Don't be easily, easily offended. Love is not easily offended. When Paul was talking in 1 Corinthians 13, he said, love is not easily provoked. Love is not easily offended. If you're easily offended at something, it shows you how much of yourself is still living. If you're easily offended at something, it shows you how much pride you still have. How much self-love you still have. How much Christ is not living. You see what I'm saying? God wants to put his finger on offense and warn the church once again, beware of offense, beware of the bait of Satan, as John Bevere called it. The bait, offense is the bait of Satan. Now, if you look in the, if you look in the Greek word for what the word offense means, this word is derived from the word scandalon, which is the name of the part of a trap to which the bait is attached. In other words, it's the movable stick or trigger of a trap. I'm on point C. This is why this word can mean the trap or the snare itself. And so this, this word for offense that Jesus uses is any impediment placed in the way causing one to stumble. See, offense is the bait of Satan. When you bite in and you give in to offense, it's just like an animal that's just been entrapped by a, tra by a snare. When you bite into offense, whatever it would be, it's like you are now entrapped by that very scheme of the devil. And the only person it hurts is you. It doesn't hurt anyone else except for what you do out of your offense. See, when we get offended, we perceive, okay, someone is insulting me. Someone is disregarding me. Someone is rejecting me. And we get annoyed or angered or resent or reject. See, so many in the church are so easily, easily offended. And I believe the Lord would warn us, don't be so easily offended. Now, as, as I've been an elder in our church for over 20 plus, probably 25 years, I don't know the exact time frame, I've seen many examples of how people get offended. And I'm going to just share some examples. And I want to say this. If you want to be wise, learn from the mistakes of other people. I'm about to tell you some real world, world, real world examples of things that have happened over the past 25 years, when people got offended, so learn from their examples so you don't have to repeat their mistakes. I was thinking about this and, and, and how to disguise people's identity here, because they, really, they don't go to this church anymore, but just to disguise their identity, and I thought about the, the Bob Newhart show. I, I feel like my dad bringing up Hee Haw, but how many of you have ever watched the Bob Newhart show? Okay. How many of you remember Larry, Daryl, and Daryl? Okay, I haven't thought about them in years, but for the millennials out there that don't know about Larry, Daryl, and Daryl, you need to go look it up. But basically, it was these three brothers, and they had come from the country of, I think, New Hampshire, and the idea was their, their mom was so country, she didn't know what to name the third son, so she just named him after the second son. And so it was Larry, Daryl, and Daryl. And so anyway... I'm going to use Larry, Daryl, and Daryl for these examples so we don't realize, uh, you know, uncover their true identity. <laughs> Larry, Daryl, and Daryl. I'm, I'm Daryl. No, I'm Larry, and this is my brother Daryl, and this is my other brother Daryl. I remember, and I'll s s say this, I remember my favorite part about the Bob Newhart show was the very end because 
they, you know, they, they were spoofing the MGM lion that roared really loud. And then at the very end, they had this little cat that got on there and went, meow. <laughs> I, I just thought, as a kid, I thought that was the funniest thing I've ever heard. But anyway, <clears throat> first one I want to talk about is a gift not being recognized. There was a guy named Daryl, and uh, he was a part of our organization. And he had a particular gift, talent, or ministry calling. He was this particular person, Daryl, had a position. And he felt like, Daryl felt like this particular position needed to be more recognized. Daryl had been serving very, very faithfully. Daryl had done a great job of serving behind the scenes. But Daryl felt like because of his t title and his position, he felt like I needed some more spotlight on myself. He didn't, Daryl didn't use those words, but he came to us and, you know, he, he wanted to go off and do certain things. And we said, Daryl, right now, this is not a time to do that. We, we're, we don't sense that this is the right thing to do because of different constraints. And so what happened was Daryl, got offended. Daryl got so angry because what happened is Daryl felt like his ministry gift, his calling was not being recognized and he perceived that our saying no was us rejecting him. And that sense of rejection where he couldn't do what he felt like he wanted to do he wanted to be in the spotlight. He wanted people to see him. He wanted people to say, wow, Daryl and his two brothers, Larry and Larry, are awesome, you know? And he wanted to, to be right in the spotlight. And because he didn't get that, he got offended and he left. And he stayed immature. Like most likely, Daryl will never mature beyond that because offense keeps you immature. See, we want to, if we're going to learn the lessons from Larry, Daryl, and Daryl, did I call him Daryl or Larry? I call him Daryl. Okay, I should have called him Larry. His name was Larry, not Daryl. Um, if we want to learn the lessons from Larry, Daryl, and Daryl, we want to know, okay, ministry is not about you and your gifting and your calling. If you really want to be in ministry... It's all about serving. Jesus said it himself. If any one of you wants to be a leader, then you must become the servant of all. It's not about how great your gift is or how talented you are or how anointed you are or how much revelation you've got. The true authentic test of if you're going to be used of God to express that to his body is do you have a servant's heart that is willing to serve behind the scenes when no one else notices? And are you okay with that even if no one gives you praise? But Larry got offended and he left. Not Larry, my friend Larry, thankfully. Now Daryl, there was a guy named Daryl dealing with leadership, correcting an issue. Daryl had a gift of prophecy. Every single Sunday, Daryl wanted to prophesy. Every single Sunday, it was thus saith the Lord. Every single Sunday, Daryl had a word from the Lord. The problem was, Daryl had deep wounds of rejection. The problem was, every time Daryl prophesied, it came across like God hated this church. I mean, really, it was like, man, okay, you could be in the best mood. You could have just touched heaven. You could just feel the love of God pouring down. And all of a sudden, here comes Daryl, and he says, Thus saith the Lord. You know, basically, you or woe to you. And started prophesying all this stuff of the, just, you always felt like, okay, God is so mad at me. So leadership, we had to correct the issue. And we had to say, Daryl, listen, you've got some rejection issues you haven't worked through. Those rejection issues are causing you to view God as if he's always mad at you. And because you think God's mad at you, you're projecting his anger to the body of Christ. Uh, Daryl, 
I'm always forgetting which one I'm on. Daryl, you, you need to be made whole. You need to be healed. You need to get set free from rejection. You need to be ministered to. And so what happened was Daryl, because of a root of rejection, took the correction as rejection. And see, the leadership was trying to be a father to Daryl. The leadership was trying to be a father to Daryl and say, hey, listen, get the wounds healed. You need to get these wounds healed. But he couldn't receive the correction because of rejection, and he got offended, and he left. The third one, leadership not receiving a prophecy. So a person comes in, and they believe, I'm hearing from God. I've got a word from the Lord for this church. I've got a word from the Lord for people in this church. And they share the issue, or they share the words with the leadership, and the leadership says, okay, we're going to pray about this. But we detect there's some mixture in the words, and we say to this particular person, we're going to call him Daryl. We say, Daryl, there's a mixture in what you're saying. No, but I've heard from God. No, Daryl, there's mixture in what you're speaking. There's mixture in what you're saying. You need to be trained and you need to be mentored. You need to learn about the way protocol is followed in the local body. No, but I've heard from the Lord. I've heard from him. And so what happens is Daryl gets offended because leadership has had to correct a particular issue. And out of that offense, they bite into the bait of Satan. And then, boom, you never hear from him again. See, we want to learn from this, don't we? These are lessons for us. Is we don't want to get offended if we're corrected. We do not want to get offended if, if, if a word, it has mixture and the leadership says, okay, hey, th- there, this needs to be Uh, stated differently. We don't want to get offended if we say, hey, there's wounds here you're ministering out of. There's wounds that you're ministering out of. No one can see. I mean, everyone can see them but you. There's blind spots you don't see. See, we want to be a we want to be a father and a mother to everyone in this local church. It's not about control. It's about fathering and mothering a family of people in, in this local ecclesia. And so we need to learn those lessons. Don't get so easily offended. Everyone, the the, the leadership here, we want to have a shepherd's heart to release the entire body into the work of ministry. But But if you have issues that create such a sensitivity to offense, you need to not be so sensitive. And usually what happens is there is a root of rejection That's driving you. See, what happens is, if we have been rejected in the past, there's so many different ways we could be rejected. What we do is we build up this mechanism of self-defense to protect us from rejection. They're called expectations. And we say, if these, if to protect me from rejection, I've got these expectations that I have that these expectations must be met. If these expectations are not met, then, then you have rejected me. And because I felt, feel rejected, I'm now taking offense because you have rejected me. No, the problem is in your own heart, you're rooted in rejection rather than the love of Jesus Christ. The problem is you are rooted in rejection instead of the love of Jesus Christ that that is beyond knowledge like Paul talks about. And because you're rooted in rejection, you are perceiving this correction as people rejecting you. Your expectations are not met, therefore you get offended. Here's another one I've seen often. A particular person struggles in their relationship with God. They don't feel loved by God. They, they, they live under a cloud of condemnation. They don't feel like God likes them. They don't feel like God loves them. And so what they do is they place 
they associate a spiritual leader with the Lord, and they say, this spiritual leader, and they set up expectations. If, if, if God really loves me, this spiritual leader will do this, 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 or this. And they set up expectations. And then when that leader does not meet those expectations, a fence comes in, and they get offended at God, and they get offended at the leader for not meeting the expectations, and then they can no longer hear from him. Now, if I've done that to you, don't come tell me. <laughs> I remember, I don't know, 10 years ago, we were having like a reconciliation service. And some particular person, this is, by the way, not wise, some particular person came up to me and he said, Brian, my brother, you know, I was so offended when you did this, this, and this. And I'm like, I had no idea you were offended at me, but now you've made the problem a lot worse. <laughs> Don't come and tell me how I've offended you if I don't know I've offended you. That's not wise. And so anyway, I just kind of went, bless you, bless you. And then I had to work through my own offense. So when people have offended you, if they don't know that they have offended you, work through it on your own. Don't go to them and go, if they don't know it, and go, you offended me because you said this, this, and that. It's not profitable. See, when, when we associate a leader with the Lord himself and we set up expectations that this leader will look at me or this leader will talk to me or this leader will invite me to their house or they'll do this, this, and that. And when those expectations are not met, it can create offense because without even realizing it, we're associating the leader with the Lord and it feels as if the Lord himself is rejecting us. Don't bite into that trap. It's a trap of the devil. Sometimes God will allow a leader to not meet your expectations so that you don't look to a leader, but you look to the Lord himself as your source and as your father and as the one who is going to show you and be in that relationship with. And so what happens is the person takes offense at the leader, no longer can hear the leader, and then boom, they're out the door. God not meeting my expectations. Another person comes and they struggle with God's love. And they don't feel like God loves them. They, they're under condemnation. They don't know, and they don't have this intimate relationship with the Lord. And, and feeling rejected by God, they set these expectations that if God really does love me, then God will act this way. You know, when they set up expectations, if God really loves me, he will bring a breakthrough in my circumstances. If God really loves me, he'll bring a healing in this situation. If God really loves me, he'll give me this business opportunity or this favor or this open door. If God really loves me, he'll do this, this, and this. And then when God delays the answer to the way we expect him to work, how easily we get angry and offended at the Lord. So many people in the church today are mad and offended at God because God didn't do what he thought they should do. God didn't meet their expectations. God didn't do what they expected him to do because it was a guard and a mechanism for what they think God should do so they know and they can categorize and define what God's love really looks like. And they get offended at God. And they leave the church. And they abandon the faith. And they walk away from the Lord angry. And the problem was... They had set up expectations of what God should do for them to prove his love for them instead of having encountered the love of Jesus Christ that has no attachment to any expectations. Instead of being experiencing the, the overwhelming experiential love of Jesus Christ that is like an ocean, wave after wave of affection that has nothing to do with what God does for you or doesn't do for you, 
It's based on his love for you. It's based on his affection for you. It's based upon the way he feels about you. See, when those things don't get met, we think God doesn't love me. See, how many people have been offended at God because of that? How many people have in their heart, without even thinking about it, you know, even in their heart becoming, have grown angry at the Lord? You should have done this. If you really loved me, you would have provided for me here. If you really loved me, you would have done this. If you really loved me, you would have prevented this. If you really loved me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, without realizing God's eternal purpose, without realizing God's purpose and plan for you is from the foundation of the world, he's called you into a relationship with himself. He's called you into the very relationship that the Father and the Son have. You have been invited into that type of intimacy with God. It has nothing to do with how God provides for you externally. That is not how we define God's love. That is not how we define God's acceptance. Now, God does bring breakthrough, praise God. God does bring healing. God does bring provision. But he doesn't always do it. And if we expect God must do this or else he doesn't love me, then we're setting ourselves up for offense. Another one is the church it gets so offended these days at the truth. Hyper grace that is making its way through the body of Christ in America and around the world. This hyper grace attitude that I'm just going to go sit in daddy's lap and drink a cup of Starbucks with daddy as he gives me a massage or whatever. Not having any fear of the Lord. This idea has caused many people to just want to be blocked to the truth. So the person, this particular person, they have a revelation of God's love. They know God loves them. They've experienced his incredible kindness. They've experienced his incredible love, his passion for them. And they, they you know, kind of like the Song of Solomon, they've drank the wine of the banquet hall, and they can't, they're just so filled with God's love, and they just can't get past God's love. The problem is they have only seen one small smidget of God. Paul said there's the kindness and the severity of the Lord. There's both. There is both God's grace and his mercy and his love and God's judgment and correction and his discipline. And so whenever the truth is preached to drive them and move, well, let's say move them into maturity, move them on and exhort them on to Christ-like maturity, something in them cringes. Something in them just is unsettled. What's happening is they're being offended by the truth. Paul said in Galatians, have I become your enemy because I'm speaking the truth? And if I become your enemy, don't tell me. Just deal with it. <laughs> I don't want to hear about it. No, I'm kidding. Have I become your enemy because I'm speaking the truth? See, we want the full revelation of God. We want the full revelation of Jesus Christ. We don't want to just get locked in to one aspect of his nature. We want to see him exactly as he is. We don't want to fall in love with another Jesus. You know what the Lord put on my heart this week? I was thinking about the message from last week, another Jesus. As the Lord put this phrase in my heart, the harlot church has fallen in love with another Jesus. Revelation 17 and 18. We are witnessing a widespread increase of the church falling in love with another Jesus. That's scary. Have you fallen in love with another Jesus or are you in love with the Jesus of Scripture? That comes by revelation. The harlot church, Revelation 17 and 18, is in love with another Jesus. God help us. If we 
get offended at the truth. And something in us cringes when the truth is spoken. Then maybe we have fallen in love with another Jesus. And not Jesus of Scripture. Not the eternal Son. Not the unveiling of the Son of God in Scripture. The full counsel of God's Word. We want the gracy, lovey, dovey, kind Jesus. And believe me, God, Jesus is incredibly loving and incredibly kind and incredibly merciful. But I've seen it over and over Walls go up when Jesus comes in fire and intensity because we want the lovey-dovey Jesus. We want the Jesus in the banquet hall. But if you only have that, that revelation of Jesus, I've seen it over and over and over. You will remain immature. You will remain a kid. You will remain an infant in Jesus Christ. We need the full revelation of him. As he is, we want to fall in love with him. Even, even when he disciplines us, those whom I love, I discipline and reprove. We want to fall in love with the Jesus of Scripture and not become so offended. Jesus said, blessed is the one who is not offended at me. I believe that if the true Jesus came to speak in most churches in America... First of all, the leadership probably wouldn't let him speak. Or they would give him the agenda of what he can say and not say. But Jesus would split the church, not even in half, but reduce the church down to such a small size because he would speak the truth. This is my, this is my litmus test of how seeker-sensitive a church is. Would they allow the two witnesses of Revelation 11 to come and speak at a church or a conference? Think about that for a second. How many church conferences, how many events, how many church services, how many leaders would allow the witnesses, the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11, likely Elijah and Moses, how many of them would truly allow them to come speak in their event or their conference? <laughs> I mean, really, they would absolutely not. Now, that tells me we've got a major problem in the church. Would you agree? <laughs> they are the very voice of God from the throne. They would be the very oracle of God to the church. And like we sing about today, building their own kingdoms, their kingdom would be threatened by what would come out of these, the voice of these two witnesses. That tells you whether we're seeker sensitive or not. I hope to God I'm always allowing, Lord, there is an open invitation for the two witnesses to come. I'm kidding a little bit, but if, they, if I'm alive and we're alive when they are actually on the earth, they are more than welcome to come speak at Restoration Life. Amen? Amen? There's an open invitation for the two witnesses to speak at our church. See, we don't want to be easily offended. I can guarantee you this, including myself, and I dread it, every one of us are going to be tested in this message. God help me. God help us. Not to get offended. Help us not to get offended. Help us not to bite down into the bait of Satan and become entrapped and ensnared by the schemes of the devil and remain immature as a child. God help us. Don't get offended. Don't get offended at truth. Don't get offended if God corrects you. Don't get offended if something has to be pointed out that needs to be changed. Don't get offended. It's the love of God that is moving you into maturity. See, I look at it as like if it's truly the Lord, if it's truly his correction, if it's truly the Lord speaking, then this works to my benefit, doesn't it? Because you're helping me 
become more like Jesus. That's what I want. See, if you get easily offended at the truth, it just shows you your, the image you really want is not Christ, but your own image. Let's not get easily offended. All right, we'll move on here. Otherwise, we'll be keep speaking and you'll get offended at me going too long. So let's, let's look at the third point here. Mark chapter 6, verse 3. It's familiarity. I think, I think in a local church, one of the greatest things that hinders a local church from growing into the image of Jesus Christ is becoming familiar. I mean, if, if Jesus struggled with this, if Jesus struggled with it, and Mark 6 verse 3, they, the, they were saying, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the mother and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And so the people of Nazareth, they knew Jesus. They were so familiar with Jesus. I mean, they probably had his furniture in their house. They had watched him grown up. They had watched him do all these things. The people of his hometown had become so familiar with Jesus. Listen to this. The Son of God who created the heaven and the earth with a mere few phrases could do no miracle in Nazareth because they were familiar with him and their familiarity caused them not to receive. From Jesus. Isn't that crazy? I mean, Jesus, his, the entire universe is hanging by his word and still is. Even when he was on the earth, the universe is hanging by his very word. Yet he was constrained from doing miracles in Nazareth because of their familiarity with him. This is our brother. This is our friend. This is the one who makes our furniture. This is the one who's Mary's son and Joseph's son. And they, they were so familiar with him, they couldn't receive. Isn't that a challenge to us? Familiarity breeds contempt. It really does. And we know someone well. Seeing their faults and shortcomings, we have a tendency to lose respect and honor for them. <coughs> Dishonor creeps into our hearts and we stop receiving because of familiarity. It's so deadly. It's so dangerous. I, this is not just, this is, a, this is a problem in every single local church. I'm convinced it is. I mean, I know when, when dad was the full-time senior pastor, I mean, you know, I'm so familiar with dad. I mean, this is the guy that taught me to drive and you know, we almost got a divorce like 20 times when he taught me how to drive. <laughs> I mean, it, it was funny when, when Callie was alive and he would correct Callie. I was, always felt like, man, that brings me back to when I was 16. He's like, Callie! You know, but I just remember, you know, Dad, we're trying to drive this stick shift to Lake Altoona, and he's like, or we would be driving, and he'd be like, slow down! I was like, Dad, I'm not going fast. Slow down! Slow down! Finally, I remember we were pulling up to this gate in Lake Altoona, and you had to get close to it to put the card in. I was driving a stick ship. And he's like, Brian, you're getting too close to the pole. Dad, I'm not getting too close to the pole. Brian, you're, you're a little too close to the pole. Dad, I'm not getting too close to the pole. Brian, I think you're getting too close. Dad, I'm not getting too close. The next thing I know, scraping right against the pole. I put the scratch marks all over my dad. I remember in college, I'm telling you stories because this is what I had to work through to be able to receive from my dad. I'm telling I remember being in college, and me and my college uh, buddy were like, hey, let's play a joke on my dad. It was Saturday night. It probably wasn't the wisest thing to do. But we went to, I don't know, the grocery store, and we bought this non-alcoholic beer. I just remember it. It was in this white can, and it said non-alcoholic beer. That's all it said on it. And, I was, and I, we were like, we'll go in and act, tell your dad that you know, we're drinking a beer, if he wants to drink a beer with us. So we, we come in, and he's actually, he's actually asleep that night, and he comes out and... I'll, I'll never forget it. He comes out and he had his T-shirt on and his boxers and he's, he didn't have his glasses on. I was like, what is that? I was like, it's, it's just a beer, Dad. No big deal. I covered up him with my finger, the non-alcoholic part. It's just a beer. He like, then he was like, took it right out of my head and poured it out. <laughs> sorry, if I've never apologized, sorry. <laughs> my point is, 
this is the man that taught me to drive. This is the man that, you know, I played jokes on. He played jokes on me. This is the guy that sang at 6 in the morning with headset on and sang out, eh, you know, you've all seen the videos. This is the guy who would wake me up with a shofar singing, this is the day the Lord has made. And now I've got to work through my familiarity with him to, uh, uh, to see him as the man of God he really is. You see what I'm saying? All of us have this problem. I'm sure every one of us have this problem. And we all have this problem. All of us are different degrees. And I, I could just go, when, when Dad would go, I just saw the, just the, the testimony. Dad would preach message after message in this church with some measure of, of results to it. He would go into Africa where they, where they looked at him without familiarity and they looked at him as a man of God sent by God to Africa to them as a true apostolic prophetic voice. And the difference between their receptivity in Africa and here was mind-blowing. I just remember just seeing them. Just, just I mean, they, everyone in Africa calls him Papa or Daddy. I'm thinking they might change the name of the airport to Ken Kessler International Airport. And they love, I mean, he is the most famous guy in Africa. I'm telling you, you need to go on a mission trip with him because, I mean, he is like the most, he's a papa, of the paparazzi come out when Ken comes into town in Africa. For real, I'm serious. And I just see, okay, what is the difference? What is it about when he preaches the very same message here in America and the very same message there in Africa, what is the difference between the way God moves? And I believe one of the differences is familiarity. A prophet does not have honor except in his own home. A prophet in his own home doesn't have honor because of familiarity. And so the way this works in a local church, the Lord could be giving the leadership message after message straight from the Lord. And because, you know, like in my case, because it was my dad, it was the guy I played jokes on, it was the guy I heard sing, it was the guy who woke me up at, you know, six in the morning saying, this is the day the Lord has made. It was the guy that taught me to drive, all that stuff. The familiarity uh, builds up. And what happens is, the, dis, the dishonor creeps in. My perception altered my reception. I perceived him this way, and that perception hindered my ability to receive. Now, I would imagine every... And I, know, I know I spoke this message down in Edison when I spoke uh, at Ben's church. They have every single... I mean, even at Terry's church, I would imagine they have this problem. You know, Terry can go and do a conference, and people come all over the country to hear Terry Bennett speak, and, you know, I mean, just flock to every word he says. Yet I would imagine that the people at his own home church would really struggle with this familiarity. I'm sure they do. See, that's the challenge in a local church. It's the challenge, I believe it's a huge challenge that keeps us immature. It's kind of quiet. <laughs> Trust me, you don't have to, don't come to me after church and say, you know, I'm so sorry for not, I, I totally get it. I, it. It is a struggle for every single one of us. I mean, you know, whatever it is, but the Lord wants us to break through the familiarity. See, everyone, especially my wife, knows every one of my quirks and hang-ups and all that stuff. But I don't have many, do I? <laughs> None at all. Angie does, really. She does not. She has like one or two, but I have like a thousand that Angie and Anna always let me know about. But, I mean, you know, you're so familiar that it hinders our ability to receive what God is speaking. And when I spoke at Ben's church, that message, it was, a big, it was a big hindrance for them to be able to hear what God is speaking through Ben. I mean, when Ben came to speak here, I mean, I thought you guys were going to fire me and hire Ben. I mean, everyone loved Ben. It was such a powerful message. It was so impactful. And I think Ben was shocked at the reception of it, honestly, because... 
he doesn't get that in his own home church. There, you know, Ben is, you know, someone's brother or son or you know, son-in-law or, or whatever, all the different family dynamics going on there. And they see him like that. And therefore, their receptivity is hindered by their perception, which ends up hindering their ability to grow and to mature. Here's another thing that I've noticed. I just want to key you into this. I've noticed this. The accuser of the brethren, knowing the way this dynamic works. See, Jesus said that if you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you will receive a prophet's reward. So in other words, if you receive someone in the very way God has anointed and called them, and you overcome the familiarity you have with them, then you receive a prophet's reward. You receive the revelation they operate in. That very revelation they operate in is then imparted to you and becomes your own revelation. The issue that we have to get over is our ability to receive based on perception rooted in familiarity. And so based on this principle, this principle cannot be violated. It will, the, the Lord has just established this principle of, of the Lord giving bread to leaders to feed the sheep. That's what the Lord told Peter. If you love me, feed my sheep. This could apply to dad, me, Randall, any of the leadership team, anyone who would preach. How easy it is to become familiar with the vessel and all the hang-ups, and I have many hang-ups, Angie can tell you, she can give an amen, to become familiar with the vessel so that we no longer perceive them in the way God has called them and anointed them, that then hinders our receptivity. The devil, knowing this, has a strategy, and it's called accusation. And the devil works to put accusations in the minds of people towards spiritual leaders. It's not just me. It's just, this is just a principle. You could go preach this in any message around the world. It is, a, it is a warfare principle of the enemy. I want to expose for a second. The enemy will put accusations against a leader in someone's mind. A lot of times they're rooted somewhat in truth. This person does this. We, I mean, every one of us have blind spots. I have spots I'm blind to. You have spots you're blind to. So the enemy will take certain things that the leader does or says and magnifies those in your mind to create accusations against that leader, which then will cause offense in your heart so that you perceive them a certain way, and that hinders your receptivity of the word of God that the Lord has given them. That makes sense what I'm saying? And I say this from total experience. And, and I, I believe it is, and I, I don't even, I think it's just a, a real strategy of the enemy in local churches. Because the greatest place where you should be growing is from the ministry in any local church. The devil's strategy for those that he's called to the local church is to do this to alter the receptivity so that we become familiar with the vessel and it hinders our receptivity. Because, that, because God wants to give, see the way the Lord wants us to work, God wants, you know, God will give a leader a revelation. God will give the leader a teaching. God will speak to a leader a certain teaching, a certain revelation, a certain thing. He'll give them that word. And the Lord doesn't want the leader just to speak and everyone go, okay, great message. We're consumers. Thumbs up. Five-star rating. Boom. You nailed it. The Lord wants the revelation. The Lord gives the leader, the shepherd, the elder to become your revelation. It's meant to be planted inside of you. You are meant to become a son and daughter of the house. You are meant to become shaped and molded by the revelation that God has given to the fathers and mothers as elders in this house, whether this could apply to any of the elders or whoever's teaching. And you are to become, God wants, every, this, is, this is just the way every church should run, a son and daughter of the house. 
But the enemy's strategy to keep us immature and to keep us from receiving is to make us familiar with the vessel. And so then it hinders our receptivity. Now, I don't say this at all because I feel insecure. I, I don't, it sounds like, oh, he's really insecure. It's not, I promise you, that is not the reason. My, my reason in saying this is because I want everyone to, to have, I want us all to become this corporate man. I want us to become this corporate man that all share in the revelation that God's giving us corporately. And a lot of times that comes through the, the leadership. And so what, what you need to fight through is that, that familiarity we have in our heart. You could apply this to any local church. So I want to end, end this message and ask for prayer because I think I've offended... No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I want to... As I, we bring this, to a, uh, this message to a close, God wants to bring us to maturity. Individually and corporately, that we would be a people who are free from offense and free from a familiar attitude towards leadership. So if I offend you and you leave and go to another church, you can still apply this principle in that local church, all right? It's a, it's a global principle no matter where. Amen. Let's, let's, let's close with prayer. Father, we do want to pray right now. Lord, I ask you right now that you would highlight offense to us, Lord. Father, I want to pray right now. Just, just, just wait on the Lord for a second right now. Let the Lord, I believe the Lord is going to highlight to us places where we have become offended. Places where we have put up walls towards people because of offense. Places where our love has grown cold towards people because expectations were not met. Lord, I just pray right now, Lord, that you would expose to us, Lord. Expose to us, Lord, the expectations. Expose to us, Lord, the offense that we have taken. Lord, I pray that people would be liberated and set free right now from the spirit of offense. Lord, I pray you would liberate people from familiarity. I pray that in Jesus' name. We'll go ahead and stop recording right now, but I, 